Okay, just to fill in a, um, a few details. Um, so we were in Egypt, and they actually, they put Lynette in jail um, because of preaching the gospel. And so it was just a trick, you know, to get us to leave, and then, then that way they don't have the sticky wicket of, of deporting us uh, because we're Christians. Um, so anyhow, I'm, I'm trying to laugh, but... Um, uh, <laughs> I, it's it's like whoa in jail. Um, so yeah, I was pretty tense about it, but now I laugh about it. So we went to Jordan, and and I had really planned to move on to Iraq, and you know that didn't go too well. And then I was thinking maybe we'll go to Syria. <laughs> it's like okay, we'll stay in Jordan. Um, okay, you know. Uh, as I go around, um, I am your missionary, and, and so as I go to churches, I'm trying to explain uh, what it means to be a missionary, um, and then I got to back up a little bit and say, okay, what does it mean uh, to be a Muslim, and what is the context in what I'm working in, and that helps people understand the things that I do, but then I have to back up one more step and say, um, you know, what does it mean uh, to be a Christian, okay, and, and I have an outline that's going to help me, uh, there we go, you know, I'm trying to clarify, you know, who I am as a missionary, and not only am I helping Americans understand the religion of Islam, even on the field, I'm helping Muslims to understand their own religion, uh, because a lot of times, Muslims are not Muslims because they made a decision to become a Muslim. They were born into that religion. So if, if, you're, if your father is a Muslim, then legally in the Middle East, you become a Muslim. It's written right on your birth certificate and then transferred to your ID card. And so Muslims just think, hey, that's what I am. That's what I have to be. My religion is synonymous with my nationality. If I'm Jordanian, I'm Muslim. Um, that's if your father was Muslim. And there's Jordanians who are Christians, and their fathers were Christians, their fathers are Christians. They say, okay, I'm a Christian. Um, I'll try to, so I'm, it's that job of explaining, okay, how did you become an Islam, Muslim? What is the religion of Islam? Uh, what, is the, what is a relationship with Jesus Christ? And see there, you can see the vocabulary starts to change. Um, and so that's what I like to do this morning is to um, but take it in reverse order and to say, okay, who is Christ to me? Or who is Christ in scriptures? Who is, or what is the context of Islam? And what is my work as a missionary? I know we hear a lot of uh, WWJD, you know, what would Jesus do? Do any of you all have one of those bracelets? They're pretty cool. Um, the problem is, is we would never know what Jesus would do because he would have never got himself in the situation that we find ourselves into. Uh, rather, we should ask, what did Jesus do? And I had a lot of passages from Matthew, Luke, Mark, and, um, but I settled on this one, Luke 7.22. Uh, just to give us a reminder, as he preached the gospel, the blind saw, the lame walked, lepers were cleansed, the deaf heard, the dead were raised. To the poor, they had the gospel preached to them. Now, gospel means good news. And in Greek, it came in the context of like a herald would come into town and say, hey, I got some great news. We defeated the Persian army. They're not going to come in and sack our city and steal of all of our stuff. It's really tangible and practical. That's good news that, that affects my everyday life. And so it's a very applicable word that Jesus used and we know that Jesus cut right to the core of our problem, which is spiritual. And then it comes in and affects our physical. And, and I'm sure you're well aware of the history of Christianity. And, and there's a, a bit of a debate. Is it all the physical world in which we live in? Or is it the spiritual world, um, an unseen truth? Well, the fit, physical world is built on the spiritual world. The spiritual world is the unseen world is 
is often very more much real than our physical world. Um, so, yeah, I, I need to develop that a little bit more. I mean, it's like, what is our world? Is it what you can see or hear? No, it's much more than that. I mean, there's animals who can, see, can hear more than we can. Uh, there's, there's, there's devices that can see more than we can see. In fact, it wasn't within the past 20 years that we were able to see much of the stars that we never really knew they existed. Um, I have to often ask this question, um, when did electricity start or when did, when was, when, when did man have, or where, when did we get electricity? And then people start saying, yeah, isn't it 18, 19? They think, no, it's first day of creation. It was always there. Electricity always existed. We just had no idea how to, how to use it or to, to, to function with it. So how much more is there out there in this world that we just have never seen, we don't know about? Um, and, and there's a spiritual world that's, that's more real than any of that. So as we look in scriptures, and we need to establish a pretty good uh, baseline, what does it mean uh, to believe in Jesus? And, and Jesus said to Nathaniel, you know, I, I, I saw you under the fig tree. And, ja and Nathaniel was like, wow, you know, that, that you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Now that's pretty strong to make that jump you know Jesus knew he was under the fig tree and and now he's the son of God uh, the woman at the well you know Jesus came and, and told her about her past history with marriages and and she's like wow you're the Christ and she went into town and and says you know hey this guy told me everything in my past history isn't he the Christ you know if I was one of the town's men I would say no, I know your past history. <laughs> I'm not the Christ. So it's, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to be cynical. I'm just saying, you know, it's Jesus is the Christ, but how is it that people came to know him as Christ? And oftentimes it is very personal. And, 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 and sometimes, you know, I, you know, I remember when I was uh, eight years old, I was in junior church, there was some kind of a clown up front, and, and I, don't, I forget what he did. Uh, but at the end of this presentation or thing, he said, you know, who wants to go to heaven? I'm like, ah, oh, duh, I do. <laughs> and so it's like, okay, come forward and go to this room. We'll tell you how to get, go to heaven. And, and I'm like, you know, sure, that, that's for me. And, and I know, even though my, my cognitive understanding of what Christ did for me on the cross was not quite there, I knew in my heart that I wanted Jesus. That, that's my testimony, my salvation. Peter, you know, in John chapter 6, the context is Jesus uh, fed 5,000. He, he fed 6,000 another, another time and, and other thousands other times. This is the time of the, uh, the two fish and the five loaves. And, and, and so he fed the people and they started to follow him. And it's like, wow, this big crowd is following me. So he gets in the boat, crosses the Sea of Galilee. Have any of y'all been in Israel, seen the Sea of Galilee? Okay, yeah, you can see the other side. It's, it's not that wide, you can't see over there. And, but, but it's a big hoof and walk, <laughs> unless you have a boat, you know, you know straight across. And so, um, so they follow Jesus around. And, and this is when Jesus said, you know, except you... Uh, drink of my blood and eat of my flesh, you have no part in me. And it's like, wow, that's, that's kind of wild, Jesus. I don't know. And, and many of the people who followed him stopped following him. And, and Jesus said to Peter, you know, are you guys going to leave too? And, Jesus said, and Peter says, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. You are the son of the living God. No, we're not going anywhere. And, and Jesus explained to them what he was talking about is a spiritual connection, not physically eating his blood or drinking his blood, but being one with him, being in Christ, abiding in Christ, and Christ abiding in them in so much that, that Christ is internalized 
in our lives. And I, I've heard, I'm sure you've heard this preached before and explained. Um, you know, what about the, the man born blind? I don't know. I was blind, now I see. Um, pretty simple. But what about me? What about you? Is it just a doctrinal statement or a changed life? The reason I'm pounding this home is, is because out in the mission field, it's like, what is the goal of missions? Is it just to get someone to rehearse a certain statement? Oh, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. He died on the cross. Or do we really want to see a life changed and transformed? What would you answer? Okay. I would come back and say it's a false dichotomy. It's as I confess Christ as my Lord and Savior. He is the Son of God. He did die on the cross for my sins. And it's the realization of that truth that puts the Holy Spirit in me that causes a transformed life. So you're correct. The, the, the transformed life is the end game, the goal, where we're looking for. And so much that scripture makes it very clear that if, that if that manifest change has not happened, then there's not likely any heart belief that produces it. Who is Christ to the Muslims? Now it gets a lot more confusing. Uh, this is the Middle East. Uh, this is the Arabic-speaking world. Um, and this is the Islamic world, where the majority of the population there are, are Muslims. And, and so you can see, you know, it's, it's, it gets confusing. It, you can be in the Middle East, but not a Muslim. You could be Arab, but not a Muslim. But most likely, if you live in the Middle East, you're a Muslim and you're an Arab. Um, in the Middle East, as I mentioned, people are born with their religion, uh, whether it's, it's Christian or Muslim or Jew. So when Muhammad came in about 632 AD, that's when he died, uh, you, people had a choice, Arabs had a choice. If you, were, if you were born a Christian, you could stay a Christian. If you were born a Muslim, or a Muslim, sorry, if you were born into a Jewish family, you could stay Jewish. If you were born into a Christian family, you could stay Christian. And if you were Arab, you had to embrace Islam or die. Now this was the first two years, and it wasn't a lot of Arabs. But yet that ideal has kind of stuck on, even though it has not been applied. Um, and so this is what's meant by freedom of religion in the Middle East, is if, you were, if your father was Christian, you're free to remain Christian. But Muslims are not free to become Christians. As you know, we got, Lynette got put in jail in Egypt. And the, in America, we have this huge category of other. I mean, just the concept of of a government telling us what our religion has to be is totally like, it's beyond our imagination. I mean, have you ever thought the governor might enforce what your religion is? Well, maybe some of you are saying, yeah, <laughs> but we'll fix him. <laughs> That's our response. Um, Muslims, to understand Islam is to, to understand um, uh, Christianity of the seventh century when Islam came in. And a lot of Islam is a response to what they were seeing from Judaism and Christianity. And in a big way, uh, Muhammad copied right out of Judaism and Christianity where they would say, we believe in one God, uh, we believe in the prophets, and, and Jesus is one of those prophets. Uh, we believe in their books, which is the, the Bible. Uh, they call it the Torah, the Zabur, and the Injil. Uh, Injil is just a transliteration from gospel, from Greek to, into, to, um, 
uh, Arabic, but we translate the word and we don't say angel, except we say evangelical. So evangel or evangelical means we are the ones with the gospel. Um, and Zabur, I don't know where they got that word from. That's the Psalms. Oftentimes we say the, the, the law, the Psalms, and the prophets uh, and the New Testament or the Old Testament and the New Testament. So anyhow, they, they believe, they don't really read the Bible, but they say they believe in it. And so you can use that as a tool when you're witnessing to Muslims. How many of you know a Muslim or seen one or been around? Okay, wow, wow. Uh, that, that's changed. That's changed in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, and you can use this as, an, as, a, as a common point. Um, avoid this, my religion is better than your religion. Because we're not comparing religions. We can say, my savior is my best friend. Okay, and we don't have to get to that comparison uh, you know, in, in, in saying that, you know, uh, uh, you know, Jesus is better than Muhammad and, and, and or, 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 or they say we don't eat pork and we say, well, we don't eat camel. You know, it's like, so what? Um, but you can say, well, don't you believe in the Bible? And they say, yeah, but it's been changed. And you go, really? Well, why don't you show me where it's been changed? Okay. And, and okay, then you're in the word. <laughs> oh, it's great. Um, and that's where change takes place. That's what the Holy Spirit uses to transform um, lives. You look at this list about Jesus. What's missing? The resurrection. What, what predicate or what is the resurrection dependent upon? Yeah. Uh, the cross and, and deity. You know, it's interesting. To be Christ means that it's the promised one from God who must needs die and suffer on the cross. So when we confess Jesus is the Son of God, the Christ, we acknowledge his, his, his ability to save us from our sins and we acknowledge the process whereby he did save us from, his, from our sins. That's the vital ingredient that is missing from the Islamic Jesus. And so we don't, again, it, and, and that vital ingredient is sometimes missing because of a blindness, a spiritual blindness. And it's not remedied by an academic presentation. And, and, I, and that's what I've done for years is give academic explanations. What does the gospel say? Um, uh, what does the Quran say? Where is the historical evidence? But then I had to go back and say, well, well what is it that, that Jesus did? Is, is a real, tangible friend who met real needs. Uh, before I go on with that, let me just really quick say this, and, and I'm sorry, it, it may sound like a bit of a shotgun of points, but I'm trying to stick to an outline. There's what does scripture say about Christ, what does Islam say about Christ, and what do I say about Christ as a missionary? How do I present Christ? And if you haven't guessed, we're all about Jesus Christ this morning. That's what we sang about that's why we came this morning, because Jesus is the Christ. We worship him. And this was the case in the Middle East in the, in the seventh century. Most of the people believed in Jesus. Now most of them are Muslims. And, and that's something that I think we as Americans should be studying and thinking about. How did that happen? And a lot of times the, 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 the dichotomy is put oh, they were all forced to become Muslims by the sword. Or, or, or Muslims would say, no, we, we convinced people of the, the merits of Islam. Well, neither one is really true because the sword was only for the first couple of years. Uh, and, and it didn't, and, and, and even though the Islamic army moved into the rest of the Middle East, 
It was conquering to become the political rulers. It was not to force the people to embrace Islam. Uh, the, the Middle East stayed majority Christian for hundreds of years after the coming of, of Islam. But then some of these people began to realize that my present day prosperity is contingent upon me identifying with the religion of the ruling party. And they came into Islam, primarily the Persians. The Persians were Zoroastrians. Zoroastrianism, Islam. Uh, uh, okay, I'll take Islam. Whereas the Christians, re, or sorry, whereas the Egyptians remained Christians, for uh, even to this day, the highest percentage of Christians in the Middle East are Egyptians. Whereas the Christians look at Christ and what he has to offer, Islam. Well, I'll choose Christ. In fact, let me compare Christ to anything this world has to offer, and I would choose Christ. And, and I, it's really not a logical deduction. It's, it's a spiritual enlightenment. I did this the other day. I'll, I'll try it now. See how it works. Um, see if I can remember it. Um, for, for, for Christians, if, if you want to get, what should you do? Give. Um, and if you want to um, lead, you should follow. If you want to lord over, you should serve. If you want to live, you should yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's really quite opposite to what the world considers success. And, and we've, we realize this because it's a spiritual truth. Um, many of the Christians left the Middle East, um, and this is, a, this is a main point that needs to be known, is the Muslims, the, the children who are born into a Muslim family are considered Muslim, and they are not allowed to leave. Islam provides no provision for people leaving the religion. Whereas in Christianity, we're not born Christians. I would say every one of you has made a conscientious personal decision to be here this morning. In fact, you made your own personal decision for Jesus Christ. You weren't told to be here. You were instructed in who Jesus is, but that final decision is yours. When the communion plate is passed, no one twists your arm. It's an invitation. Um, it's, it's, a, um, it's a relationship. It's an opportunity to eat at God's table. Completely different how Christianity grew and how Islam grew. Okay. Who we are as missionaries. I think you figured out that there's kind of a problem here with missionaries going to the Middle East and helping Muslims to become Christians. <laughs> it's like exactly how do you do that um, without ending up in jail, uh, which could happen. And, um, but maybe not. I, I, the church came and visited us. I don't know. I can't see who was there with us, but no one ended up in jail. Um, so because that first point is a witness. Islam allows Christians to be Christians. And that's my testimony. How did we overcome? By the blood of the lamb and our testimony. It's just a matter of what I have to say for myself. Jesus is my Lord. He's my Savior. I believe he is the Son of God. Uh, we can do that. In fact, you can do that. And then as you do that in your workplace and with your family, then all of your actions become a part of your witness. And, and okay, that's how a Christian acts. That's what a Christian says. That's what a Christian does. And, and so your life is your testimony, 
is your witness. Next is to, to preach the gospel. And, and preach is, is, you know, is, is a little bit in your face, but it's a matter of making a declarative statement. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus did die on the cross, but not because I said it, but because I speak on the authority of scriptures. So it's not a, so much an argument with me, it's an argument with scriptures. And so you can take it up with God if you don't happen to believe what I say. You know, a lot of times where our arguments come in is in application. Or, or you know, it's like, okay, um, you know, you start telling people what to do or not do. Um, but that's not preaching. Preaching is, is just simply restating what is written in scriptures. Making disciples. Now, that, that's where, where we move on a little bit more. To make a disciple is to cause someone to learn. It's a little bit different than teaching. And I don't know, are we any teachers here? There probably a few. And probably I think you hear that the teacher didn't teach if the learner didn't learn. Maybe you've heard that, okay. Um, at least that's what I've been told. And, and that, that's close to, okay, discipleship. And, and there is a fine nuance there between teaching someone and causing someone to learn. And, and I would say that, that God is discipling all of us. He is creating circumstances and situations in your life that will cause you to trust in Christ. And so if you're going through a difficult problem, you should say, great, praise the Lord. Because God cares so much about me to cause me to trust him. Woe to the person who falls into calamity that has not Christ. Eh, forget about him. Um, but God has not forgotten about you. So let's, let's get to some details here. Back to Jordan. Um, that's where I live in Zarka. I, I work with Pastor Samer at uh, Zarka Baptist Church. That's, that's where we were at the church there. And, and I live over to the right, and that's, that's my house. Uh, I don't know if you can see Lynette waving from the balcony in the middle. Uh, she's not down on the street walking up there. Um, so if you come see us, then you'll, can, you'll stay up in the top floor there. That's, we, that's a guest room. They, the people, the, the landlord lives at the bottom, and, and he doesn't want to rent out the top, so... We use it in the summer. Okay, too many details. Back to the, um, uh, the look at this landscape or this skyline. What can we figure out here? You know, look at the buildings. And the, um, uh, it's all crowded. It's, it's pretty tight. So we can walk around. We don't have to get in the car. You can walk to your restaurant or your stores, do your shopping. Um, that blue arrow, the dark blue arrow, can you see what that is? It's, it's a spire on a church, and it, you can see a cross. If you had, were up closer or looked at the picture, you can see the cross. This is the Christian quarter. Not that we have to live there, but we want to live there. And by Christian doesn't mean that everyone there is Christian or that only Christians can live there. In this group, it's about 20, sorry, about 10% of the people are Christian. And when I say Christian, I mean this very broad umbrella. Orthodox, Catholic, Evangelical, anyone who, you know, says they're a Christian, you know, would be living in that area. Um, and as opposed to the area to the right or the left or in front or behind where there's no Christians uh, at all. And in fact, if, if I go over that ridge, it's another area of Zarka, there, there's no non-Christians. I, I don't know of anyone who lives over there. Um, to the right, maybe one, two families. That, that's just about it. And, and look, look at the green arrow. Do you see what that is? A mosque. Yeah, and so they had a smaller mosque just to the uh, right or to the edge. And they're building a new mosque. This, this is a huge building. Look at it. It's dominating the skyline. Yes, they're out for the hearts and minds of who? The Christians. 
They want to pull that last re remaining group you know, into Islam and definitely dominate is, is what they're trying to do. That mo the minaret's only halfway built. It's going to be skying. I'm thinking, you know, wow, what oppression. I mean, this, this is like, this is an uphill battle. And uh, sometimes I feel like I'm in a, a you know, paddling against the, the, the stream with a noodle or something, you know, just not getting anywhere. Um, but then look at the blue arrow, the light blue arrow and it just looks like one white building and that sea of white buildings but that is the new educational building uh, that the church built just right beside the church property and that's where uh, we well I was going to say meet people but that's here I'm at McDonald's <laughs> <laughs> playing backgammon um, okay it's just a little bit different somewhat the same somewhat different um, you know, it's, it's, it's a place where, where the church can, can be Jesus to the community. That is healing the sick, there's a clinic there. That is, is liberating the poor, there's an education center there. Uh, where I'm teaching English and other life skills, where we as Christians can make contact with the Muslims. And it does start with making contact being a friend, and, and so you who say you know a Muslim, be a friend to them. It's huge. That starts the witness. And then you help them out with something out, something. You know, here we're teaching English. It's meeting a felt need. We all have needs, and sometimes it's emotional friendship, sometimes it's to learn some English, sometimes it's filling out an, a job application or a tip, even where to find a job. This is huge. It makes a real difference in someone's life. And, and you know, there's one guy, um, uh, Joseph, in Egypt. He said, you know, I noticed how the Christians love each other. And, and it just, I deduced that God must be love, not hate. Because if he's hate, then the world would, or he would tear the world apart. He has to be love in order for the world to exist. And he said he wanted to become a Christian. And of course, he said later he understood that Christ died on the cross for his sins. But at that moment, he was convinced by the Christian's love for each other. We convince people of Christ by our love for them. Um, this is my, my group. We teach English um, at the, uh, the center there. And so I'm the only native English speaker. Laith, he's a Syrian, the guy in the middle. Um, he's really good with English. Uh, the Chinese couple to the right, they're missionaries from China, China, and their English isn't very good. And so there are more students. And, and Basada, he doesn't know any English. <laughs> but he's on staff because he's a good Christian. And man, he just loves to witness and share about Christ. So, okay, you're on my team. Um, and, and so this, this kind of, I have to bring this in. We started a, um, an English-speaking church for the Americans in Zarka. And, you know, and I wrote about this in my prayer letter. And then I didn't write about it again because, you know, we started out, we had 12, and we dropped to 10, then went to 8, and then to three. <laughs> Even the cat didn't want to come anymore. <laughs> um, no, all these Americans, they just moved out of Zarka, you know, and so we, you know, we love to tell these stories, you know, I planted the church and we grew, grew, grew. You know, this one went strong, strong, strong. <laughs> and, and I'm like, you know, okay, I'm not going to do this anymore. And, and so there was one lady who said, no, no, we still need to have church. And I'm like, oh man, okay. If there's, if there's one person, okay. And, and so then we got this Chinese couple to come, and then some Ukrainians who came, and then some Africans who came, and then, and then we picked right back up, you know, to about eight, 10, 12 people. It's just, our English isn't very good. <laughs> and so I was telling Pastor Steve, you know, it's like, you know these 7-Eleven songs, you know, uh, uh, seven words, 11 times, 
Well, I'm looking for the 321 songs, you know, three words, 21 times. <laughs> Uh, and so pretty much that's our church service is nice simple songs and so I'm looking for simple songs where we just sing the truth of, of Jesus Christ and so that's what he was saying holler it out sing it out this is the truth this is what I believe of Jesus um, and then there's real disciple yeah we come into we, we we study the Word of God and that's what I did with Fodage and his family um, I guess Lynette is sitting with a wife taking the picture. Um, he's like, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to realize there's something wrong with Islam. And, and he wanted to be a Christian. And he wanted his daughters to go to the Christian church because he didn't want them forced to be forced to marry a Muslim. Um, Christ, Muslim girls cannot marry Christian men. They don't allow it because the children would become the religion of the father. He doesn't want his kids forced into Islamic school. And, um, and so it's great. I, we had a home fellowship. One week was in his house, one week was in our house. And they're just, just eating it up, wanting to know what scriptures says. It's a great opportunity because they really, they can go to church if they, only if they sneak in and sneak out because Muslims are not allowed to become Christians. They're not allowed to act like they're Christians. And even that, and we don't even call each other on the phone. We just tell each other, next week, six o'clock, I'm gonna be there, okay? I'm not gonna call you to say I'm coming. I just, I'm gonna show up, and I know next week you're coming to my house because we know someone's listening to the phones, checking it out. Here's Lynette, all right, quiz time. Where's the witness? She's, she's teaching just basic kindergarten stuff here. We have a short-termer there on the left, right. Where's the witness? Try, look at the picture. Okay, thank you. There's the cross, yeah. What an offense. I mean, a lot of Muslims would see that cross and go, oh man. It, it, it's almost infuriating to them. Um, we talk about a, a stumbling block and foolishness. To Muslims, it's offensive. How could, a pro, how could God allow his best prophet to be tortured and tormented on a cross? It, it, no, that's our salvation. That's our example. It, 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 they totally missed the message. Um, Here's a number of women, they're Muslims, and they all want to hear about the cross. So, so don't be tricked by the media and thinking those Muslims. No, it's those people, and they're needy just like us. And they've just been duped like we've been duped until we heard the truth of scriptures. And, and it's by compassion um, that we go and tell them um, about Jesus. Uh, here is a Muslim lady in the middle, a church lady to the right in the green, and she's a strong evangelist. And, and, um, and so I don't know what you can, if you can see it in the background there to the left on the table, it's a sewing machine. And so this is a sewing class, you know, during the week. And so this is when the Muslims can come to the church. The church is a sanctuary, and then they can go into the educational hall. Uh, but this is where... Uh, this Muslim background believer in Jesus Christ can come and get fellowship and learn and uh, be discipled. And so as I'm closing up here, um, I don't, this is the Arab church. I'm not there with a big Arab church like this uh, where I'm preaching every Sunday, um, nor is it a small church, even though I did start the small English speaking church um, but it's a house church. It's, it's a different group of people meeting at a different location, different nights of the week. And it's somewhat precarious. We would start a good consistent group that will run on for a couple of months. And then one person will move and one person doesn't feel like coming anymore. And it just falls to pieces. Um, and then I start another group up and it maybe start off, starts off as a, as a group, um, uh, 
uh, just to get to know each other and be friends. And, and then it develops into a informal Bible study and then a very specific Bible study for discipleship. And that's the direction that I'm going. And this then begins to form little bricks that create a spiritual building and Jesus Christ. So the question is, um, and I, I don't think I have a, a slide for this, no. Um, <clears throat> who is Christ? Um, who is Christ to me? What has he done for me, and how has that changed my life? Who is Christ to Muslims? And that's something that we need to answer. Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. We didn't know anything about it 20 years ago. Now we know Muslims. Now it's in our media. It's on our news. It's in our face. We have to address it. We need to know what the world knows in order that we can bring the gospel to them. And then that's, who am I as a missionary? How am I making Christ practically applicable to my coworkers, my family, my friends? Um, every one of us, we are a missionary. I'm overseas and, and you're right here. And, and what you do and how you act and what you say makes a huge difference. And so let's close in prayer as uh, Pastor Steve or Pastor uh, Kevin will come up. Father God, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your care. Thank you for what Jesus has done in my life. And thank you for the compassion that you have shown me. I pray that you help me to apply that same compassion to others as I live my life uh, for your glory. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.